others. So taking a look at prevalence, we know that the demand for autism services is increasing exponentially here. Uh, back in uh, the year 2000, 2001, we had about 400 children with autism spectrum disorders who were receiving autism funding in this province. Today we have about 7,300 children under the age of 19 who are on the autism funding programs through the Ministry of Children and Family Development. So that's 7,300 children that we know of. Um, there could be children who are uh, not accessing or families who choose not to access those funding programs as well. So the, the, the reasons behind uh, increases are sort of wide and varied. Right now, research um, thinks about this comes from the uh, uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. About 53% uh, can possibly be explained by changes in diagnosis. We're better at diagnosing uh, right now than we were, you know, five, ten years ago, especially in BC. Um, it's estimated, uh, of course, to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that it's about 1 in 110. So that's uh, around 1 in 80 to 1 in 240 um, persons uh, have autism spectrum disorder. Um, if you just take a look at these are some states, and here's the average. So as you see, on the average around 2002, um, we're looking about uh, 6 in 1,000 children, and now we're closer to that 1 in 110 mark there. In British Columbia, as of uh, July 2011, the CDC looked at uh, eight-year-olds. So in BC, I took a look at eight-year-olds to see how many children uh, who are eight years old who are um, on the spectrum. And we have gone from 112 in 2009 to one in 93 in uh, um, uh, this July 2011 uh, of eight-year-olds. That gives us a prevalence rate overall of 1 in 128 in BC, and uh, that takes into account 0 through 18, right? So there are kids in there. Kids in this province, unfortunately, don't get diagnosed, you know, at, at two years old, like we 18 months to two years, like we'd like to see. So it does take into account that there are some children in there who are not yet diagnosed um, in 0 to 18. That's why it's a little higher for the 0 to 18 number. If we take a look at the numbers split up between uh, 0 to 18, 6 to eight, and we split it up between 6 to 18 and under 18, I'll orient you to this graph first. Here's the years. Here's 2007 of when we have some data that I was able to um, take all the way to 2011. And here's sort of the prevalence uh, rate along here, and I've actually put the ratios up. Um, if you look at under 6, uh, we've gone from about 1 in 333 in 2007 to 1 in 286 in 2011. It's a pretty sort of stable line across here. I think that's a reflection of, um, you know, the, the diagnostic standards we have in British Columbia right now, as well as, you know, there hasn't been a huge increase in the funding uh, yet uh, for uh, under six, but we are seeing a, a nice stable line here. What we see an increase in is the diagnosis of children over the age of six. We're about one in... Uh, uh, one in 169 uh, um, in 2007, and right now between 2010 and 2011, we have about a one in 100, one in 102, one in 103 um, between those. Yeah. So we had quite of a, a, an increase during this time, and we seem to be flattening off, but time will tell if we flatten off or if we continue to increase. So what do we know? We know we've got a lot of kids uh, coming uh, who require intervention. Um, and what do we know about intervention? Well, we know that it's a really politically heated, shall we say, topic. It's a scientifically multifaceted topic. Um, uh, there are some, you know, generalizations about the effectiveness of behavior interventions. I think sometimes can be misleading because what we do know is that there's differences among individuals with autism. We're not necessarily talking about autism, but we're talking about autisms, right? So uh, there's variations in families. There's variations in therapists. There's variations in the context that these interventions are done. And there's different methods of, of service delivery among them. So there are two recent reviews that I just want to cover to get us sort of an understanding of, of where we are, where the state of the science is right now. Uh, the first is Warren et al. in 2011. Both of these are 2011. And it was uh, commissioned by the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. You can actually go online and you can uh, download the whole entire 908-page document. Also an executive summary, which is quite the helpful. Next I want to talk about is something that's really hot off the presses. We just picked this up last week. Uh, 
uh, Geraldine Dawson and Karen Berner um, uh, took a look at behavior interventions in children and adolescents, and that's just recently in pediatrics, so you can uh, take a look now, at the that. The Warren et al., um, they took a look, they focused on kids aged 2 to 12. Uh, they reviewed 159 unique treatment studies, but of those, they found that 13, only 13 of those were of good quality. They judged quality by, um, they had, they asked questions regarding the design of the study, they, had, they asked questions regarding the diagnostic approach that was taken in the study, they had questions about, you know, how uh, participants were, were, um, provide, were, were chosen for the study, they had questions about the intervention characteristics, about outcome measurements, about the statistical analysis they used, and the applicability. And so with those, they, they made some judgments around the quality. And so what they found, that 13 were only of good quality, 56 were fair, and 90 were of poor quality. Major things that they talked about. There's no current medical interventions that demonstrate a clear benefit for social and communication symptoms in ASD. Evidence does support um, what they found within these studies and within their review. It does support early intensive behavioral develop and developmental intervention. So we're looking at applied, you know, the, the, the area the theory of applied behavioral analysis and also looking at the University of California UCLA LOVAS model as well as the recent uh, work that we've seen with the Early Start Denver model, um, which I'll talk a little bit about, but in terms of improving uh, performance in kids. So there's some good news there. However, we're still, you know, there's still a lot of work that we need to do in the research. Um, not all the children in intensive programs, did, you know, had rapid gains. There's no 100% here. So there's still, you know, some kids are, are having gains, but there's still some subgroups of kids that aren't. Um, many children and continue to display in, uh, impairment um, after the early in intervention years. We still have few. We're getting better with randomized control trials, but we still have few randomized control trials um, of sufficient quantity. Uh, no studies have really long-term compared the effects of one intervention or another. Um, in general, uh, and so, you know, that's the point here. In general, that things are often done in highly controlled settings. They're done in universities. There's a lot of support. There's a lot of supervision that happens around these, right? So I know that because of the work that I do in the province that one of the major issues that we're having um, is that uh, supervision of people actually doing the intervention, right? So you have a lot of people out there, behavior consultants, SLPs, you know, behavior interventionists, OTs, providing intervention, but the breakdowns that we're seeing happening with families is a lot of families, because they want to make more of their money, will spend a lot of their money on behavior interventionists. It's, you know, it's 20 bucks an hour versus 110 bucks an hour. And, but the, the breakdown comes in the quality of support in terms of the behavior interventionists being supervised and providing, getting goals set and, and sort of moving the child ahead as a team. Right, so I think some of the breakdowns happen, and you certainly can see that in the study. So, in in their studies, they sort of point out that we really need to take a look at, um, you know, what they're doing there, and can we replicate that in real life? Now, the Dawson and Burner, uh, this is, uh, as I said, very recent. Uh, again, they're um, equal to saying there's no medical interventions to address the core triad of ASDs, but there are behavioral interventions, and I think these are the behavioral interventions that were, were I think, one good thing about British Columbia is we. We have a base in applied behavioral analysis of, of people who are qualified to work uh, with especially children under the age of six with autism and so um, the studies are really sort of uh, supporting that for us. Um, but I thought it was interesting that, that what they did is they really look at interventions in terms of five types. They sort of split them up. So they're looking at early intensive comprehensive interventions. Then they took a look at the research around targeted interventions, uh, parent-mediated intervention, and then we have social skills interventions, and then we have behavior interventions ag addressing a lot of the comorbid symptomatology, so it's problem behaviors, anxiety, things like so, that. Let's take a look in each one. So if we look at early intensive comprehensive interventions, they're again agreeing with the Warren et al. study. Um, the review that you know the early Denver start model is a really good example of something that has good outcomes. That's something that really combines both 
the developmental, social pragmatic approach, as well as based within a behavioral ABA model, right? So it's really taking the best of both of those worlds and those teams are working together. Um, we have to remember in the early start Denver model in that study, those children weren't just receiving, the parents weren't just doing parent uh, uh, intervention. The kids were also receiving 15 to 20 hours of one-to-one -one intervention per week by interventionists. As well, there are SLPs involved, there are occupational therapists involved. It was a multidisciplinary team. So it really sort of shows that this multidisciplinary team has a, has a, a, a nice outcome. The Nova Scotia EIBI uh, project is, uh, uh, we all know about um, pivotal response, we, we all know, but uh, we'll talk about pivotal response training. And pivotal response training, again, is one of these methodologies that's sort of combining uh, both the, the developmental and the social pragmatic along with mo uh, some more rigorous behavioral techniques. So uh, it really is, again, providing intervention uh, from the entire team. And the Nova Scotia project really showed us that e they had some good outcomes even within the 12-month period. Right, at 15 hours a week. So it's really showing that we, we are gaining some momentum in that early intensive uh, comprehensive interventions. In terms of targeted interventions, I think uh, we can do pretty well as well. Um, uh, they're relatively brief. They, uh, you know, really focus on specific symptomatology. So Land et al. did an RCT. Uh, there was about six months of intervention. Uh, both uh, received uh, developmentally based interventions with one receiving a supplementary curriculum in, um, you know, social engagement, joint attention, things like that. And what they found that, that the, the group that received the, the supplementary curriculum uh, had improvements in, in social engagement uh, and they didn't find that for the group that was just receiving um, uh, the uh, sort of uh, intervention as, as usual. Ingersoll et al. did a group that had uh, the same sort of design, another uh, randomized treatment, uh, randomized um, uh, Control trial, thanks. Uh, the treatment group, again, showed increased spontaneous illicit imitation. So both were receiving you know, treatment as usual, and then the other one got a little package on that for a short period of time, and they had some good outcomes within, that, uh, within imitation if they're targeted. <laughs> Parent-mediated uh, interventions. Now we're sort of uh, we're sort of on the on the fence with parent, some of the parent-mediated interventions. I think um, Cassery et al. Uh, did a parent-mediated uh, intervention. For, it took about eight weeks. It focused on joint attention, and they did find that they had higher quality of caregiver involvement, and uh, which predicted greater uh, child joint engagement. Uh, Kula Can et al. in 2010 did another sort of uh, PR, used PRT, uh, pivotal response training techniques, and it did improve the child's communication skills. However, it was a small sample. On the flip side of that, there are some RC RCTs that have come out which have really um, uh, have found that there's no effect for some of the parent-mediated uh, interventions. The Hannon uh, more than words program. Uh, I, I know Veronica did a, a, a talk on that a little while ago, but certainly there are some uh, af effects on that in some studies, but the Carter et al. really found no effect on child outcomes. Uh, Green et al. Uh, took a look at the preschool autism uh, communication trial, and again, there was no effect on autism symptomatology, and uh, there was some improvement with child uh, parent-child interactions, but really so no long-term effects on language or uh, autism severity or things like that. And finally, Oosterling et al. did a focus on on parent training. It was a joint attention, language skills. It was really non-intensive. And I, I, what they did is it was a two-year intervention. Uh, they used the professional as a consultant and the parent as the, as the therapist. And at first they did four weekly two-hour sessions uh, with the group of parents followed by individual three-hour home visits every six weeks. It's not that intensive. Right? What we're seeing in some of these is they're not that intensive. And so, um, you know, what we're seeing is that, you know, parents are able to learn and successfully implement some intervention techniques, but we're uncertain if this is the most effective treatment. Maybe it's part of the package that we need to think about as a team, right? And so the theory is, is that, you know, we do need some more studies, but the theory is, I think we're still on the fence there, that early parent mediated interventions, at least before intensive intervention or part of the behavioral approaches, can, may boost the intervention response. But I don't think as a standalone, they're, they're, they're showing us to be quite effective. 
Social skills interventions. Now, uh, Raquel and Volkmar did a review and they uh, looked at um, uh, social skills training for school aged children and found it was effective for uh, um, uh, improving uh, peer relations. Uh, there's a couple of studies here that they quoted, you know, adding social skills program. Uh, found that they had greater mastery of social skills concept. Another study, uh, which has a pretty large sample of 68, did another uh, social skills program for elementary school students and found, again, they had better levels of self-control, less conflict in play, a decrease in internalizing and externalizing symptoms. So I think, again, these sort of they sort of separated this t as a targeted intervention, but it, it really is kind of a targeted intervention for social skills, and that's part of the team that can really have an effect. I don't know if um, standalone, if that's the only thing you're doing, if that's the best way to go, but certainly it's part of that package. And then there's behavioral intervention sort of addressing some of those comorbid symptoms. Uh, Lang et al. in a review, you know, really saw that cognitive behavioral therapy, if we talk, at, at, at a lot of people have been hearing about, I won't go into all the details there, but combined with social skills instruction is really effective for treating high-functioning individuals. They found that systematic desensitization, desensitization, desensitization was more effective for individuals with ASD and intellectual disability. Um, uh, uh, Brosnan et al. In, in their review said that intervention studies using ABA techniques reported a, regrease, a, 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 decrease in, a decrease in aggression. What the main element here I thought was really interesting to know in all the work that's being done here at University of BC is that really the functional behavior assessment was really the key to that. Right? So really that sort of positive behavioral support um, foundation was the key uh, for these type of interventions having a decrease. And then in an in RCT that was done um, in behavioral tre treatment in conjunction with um, some medication, uh, they found that mood stabilizing and non-stimulant attention deficit hyperactive disorder and sleep med medication did not help. However, that the antipsychotic medication in conjunction with behavioral treatment was effective in reducing some some aggressive. It's not one thing, right? It's not that one type of early intervention. It's not. Uh, it's not that that one uh, social skills program. It's not that one um, uh, uh, program for, for problem behavior. Um, what we do know is that there is no single intervention, but we do know that we need to look at the child's strengths and needs and develop the package around there, right? So, I mean, we do have this base in applied behavioral analysis that, that we work on, and all the early intervention stuff is really sort of combining that ABA base along with the developmental approach, but I think there's other things in the package that we have to look at as well. The effects are far from universal. Uh, we need to more research into the characteristics of the, of the participants. I think that some of the research is telling us that you know there is no 100% effectiveness here. So I think we have to know a little bit more about you know who does and who doesn't respond and why to different types of treatments. Um, and so identifying these sort of factors that moderate outcomes is, is really sort of a, a way to go in the future. It has challenges, but it really is essential to, to us moving forward. It's not just about horse racing interventions against each other. Or You know, I, I see in British Columbia a lot, sometimes we're pitting different types of interventions against each other rather than looking at the child and being a team around that child and providing the strengths and needs for individual children. So I think that it, it has some challenges, but we need to focus there. So the lack of 100% effectiveness and the, and the need for a, a, a comprehensive look to treatment um, really concludes that maybe we need to also look at other air variables that affect outcomes. Um, let's just talk quickly about the research we've done here at uh, UBC that I've done in collaboration with Dr. Miranda here. And uh, we took a look at examining individual differences among kids with autism and how these differences affect their outcomes over time. And uh, you start here because, you know, it's all often really difficult to, to um, put one treatment, as I said, against another because many parents, you know, they want to choose one intervention. I know you guys probably work with parents out there, and if you said, well, I'm going to choose the intervention that your child's going to do for the next year and a half, it's not going to happen. If we look at some predictors of outcome, there's uh, we know that IQ, kids with higher IQ do better over time. Uh, we know that if you start earlier, you do better over time. We know that if you have less severe symptomatology, you do better over time, but I can't 
you know, we're not going to get started on what IQ measures for um, a young child, if it measures anything. Um, I can't turn back the time, and a child shows up in my in, in, to say they want intervention. We don't hop into a time machine and say, well, you know, we, you should have been here um, three years ago, and uh, so let's let's start earlier. And autism severity, that's what they're coming for you. Like, the, you know, kids have a certain severity level. So these are really unchangeable, and they really tell us little about what, what, um, what characteristics of a child that we can target in intervention in general. Whatever intervention type you choose, whatever sort of brand you're choosing, um, what, what type of skills can we target. So we did a longitudinal study of early intervention outcomes. Uh, it was done here in Dr. Miranda's lab. Uh, it was contracted by the Ministry of Children and Family Development. I did not work for the Ministry of Children and Family Development at the time, so just got to put that out there. Um, it was a three-year term from 2001 to 2004, and then we had a follow-up uh, at a, on a postdoc uh, fellowship that um, we attained from Autism Speaks, uh, which was National Alliance for Autism Research at the time from 2005 to 2007. We took data at the entry to early intervention six months later, 12 months later, 24 months later, 33 months later, and 53 months later. So we had quite a longitudinal study. It was exciting. Uh, the mean age of our participants in our first, uh, the first wave of our study, the first one I'm going to show to you, we had 69 uh, kids. They were about four years, two months at the start of early intervention. Remember, this was way back in 2001. So, um, you know, I don't know how well we're doing at diagnosing children, but I think we're a little better than four years, two months. I don't know. Uh, the final uh, at, uh, at T6, where we had 41 kids at the end, we had, uh, there was about nine years, uh, uh, four months. Again, as we typically know, more males than females. Uh, we had CAR scores. We didn't uh, have access at that time to the ADOS or ADIR, so we had to use the a Childhood Autism Rating Scale, um, and they all fell within the spectrum of autism. Uh, we took, to the, took a look at the Mullen for nonverbal IQ, which was the average was 48, but there was quite a range up to 124, and parent education, most uh, fell in in between professional diploma and some university. And primarily, most of uh, the families had English as a first language. The, all, the early intervention that they receive was about 15 to 20 hours a week of year-round intervention services for two years. Um, they were either provided through the early intensive behavior intervention programs that we had here in the province, uh, or they were provided through individualized funding, which is what we have now in the province. Um, the intervention for all children was pretty much what we consist, consider eclectic or comprehensive, uh, I don't know, comprehensive of the world, but eclectic where it was based in the principles as, uh, of ABA, but again it used the team approach of SLPs were involved, OTs were involved, and other professionals. So that certainly that, that multidisciplinary team. We did find that there were no significant differences between the kids that were uh, receiving uh, intervention through early intensive behavior intervention clinical uh, clinic programs. These programs were also done in the home, so it wasn't like one was one was clinic based and one was home based. And most of them were done in the home. They were pretty much equal, and we actually found no difference uh, between these programs for any of the relevant measures. So we were able to combine those two groups. Uh, so the first study, we took a look at behavior predictors of language development over two years, uh, and this was some of my doctoral work with um, Pat Miranda and, and Bruno Zumbo. And we asked, what are some of the factors that influence the differential language outcomes? So we're now taking a look at what we're seeing in the research of saying, let's talk about the characteristics of kids and see what are the differences in the characteristics of children, and that may help us to um, know a bit more about what to target. What we found was social unresponsiveness. And so uh, one of the predictors was kids who were rarely smiling, didn't look at faces very well, weren't actively avoid were actively actively avoiding on eye contact, we're really failing to respond to one, one's name, regardless of what their nonverbal IQ was and autism severity at time one, um, they uh, made significantly less progress in vocabulary comprehension, vocabulary production, and language comprehension over two years. 
Um, inattentiveness was another predictor. And inattentiveness we defined as, you know, you're not paying attention to sights and sounds in the environment. You might be distracted by other noises. You may not be listening to instructions or a story. You may be looking away from the task to notice other things going on in the room. This is basically, you know, you're not really paying attention very well. It's not joint attention per se, but it's just sort of inattentiveness in general. And again, regardless of nonverbal IQ at time one and regardless of the uh, child's autism severity, Kids who had high scores for inattentive, who had more of these uh, types of, um, uh, of inattentiveness um, uh, characteristics, uh, made significantly less progress in vocabulary production and language comprehension over two years. So we take a look at that in a graph form. I'll orient you to the graph. Here's the age and months here, and this is the expressive uh, one-word picture vocabulary test. This is the raw score, so this is the words uh, children are identifying. Um, and here is, I've combined the inattentive scores and the socially unresponsive scores. And here's the mean. So this is kids who had, you know, average inattentive and average socially unresponsive kids. All these children have autism. And they had sort of a nice, uh, you know, increase over the period of two years in their skills. Now you take a look at children uh, who had uh, even less inattentive and socially unresponsive skills. They were uh, one standard deviation uh, below the mean, so they did better. They were more attentive per se and more socially responsive. And you see here they have a greater sort of trajectory in terms of their development over two years. These are the kids that didn't have great uh, attention skills or socially responsive skills and you see here, you can see quite a difference in spread two years later. You can see here we're a little closer but as time goes on, if you're not good in these skills, it doesn't bode well over time for you. So the summary is that prior to the start of treatment, it, it really appears that inattentiveness and social unresponsiveness hinder language engagement. So identifying these predictive relationships really can help guide some of uh, the treatment uh, for kids with better outcomes. You know, we can really start looking. It does tell us that you know it supports the, pro the, the process that we do in intervention on providing focused instruction and really focusing on attending skills. That's really important. Um, and that the notion that socially effective skills uh, uh, play a really a central role in language development in this population and that you know the, it really emphasizes the importance of social behaviors early on and how they affect later language development and you know we still have much to learn so um, Dr. Miranda and I um, took a look at um, the same group of children and we were able to get data for now four to five years later so we wanted to keep on going. And in this study, we identified pre-linguistic behaviors of kids to predict language development over four to five years. We had 44 kids with ASD, 34 boys, uh, 37 boys, 7 girls. Uh, again, the average age was 3 years, 11 months. Uh, it did have quite a big range. And all kids, again, received that same type of early intervention that I talked about earlier. All parents uh, completed the MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventory, and so we use this. This was our, 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 um, our, what we used to pull our predictors from. Again, in our data analysis, uh, we did uh, growth curve modeling. Uh, I did sort of a multi-level individual growth curve modeling using SAS Proc Mixed, but I looked at the pre-language skills as uh, um, some of the pre-language skills uh, predictors in the, from the MacArthur um, uh, scores and looked at how they predicted the trajectories or the rate of development of vocabulary comprehension, language comprehension, and language production, including vocabulary and language. The, the, the PLS, the preschool language scale, and the expressive one-word picture vocabulary test. What we found that there is one predictor, and that predictor came from uh, a uh, a group uh, called Gains and Routines in the. Uh, um, uh, MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventory. And um, it was the ability to play these, and in this, uh, in, in the questionnaire, there's a, a, a sub-scale which asks these questions. Does your child play peekaboo? Does your child play patty cake? Do they play so big? Do they play chase? Do they sing? Do they dance? And people say yes or no. And what we found that scores on games and routines uh, didn't, uh, Oh, we, we found that they predicted language, sorry, they pre it predicted language production. It was, it was close to significance, uh, but it wasn't.
It wasn't significant, but it was close. But it did have an effect on, on language production. So what we saw here is kids who had, I'm going to orient you to this one. This is the, the latent language production uh, score. And this is uh, um, an example of an average growth curve of uh, over four to five years of a, of a typical child uh, with a, you know T1 games and routines that were plus or minus one standard deviation. What is really interesting in this is that you see over the period of time that we're all starting around the same. There isn't a big difference between uh, their language production scores um, at time one. But you really see the difference, especially the, the, the average group and the group that doesn't have many at all. I mean, they're starting pretty much at the same spot. But over time, because they, you know, I'm not saying because they weren't able to do those specific skills, but because they weren't e providing evidence of playing chase, playing patty cake, playing those social interactive type of games that kids do, um, uh, you really, we really found that they, they had less language uh, production over over five years, and uh, to get a predictor, or not, you know, we're not patting ourselves on the back, but to get a predictor of five years later on forty four kids is pretty pretty significant. So we're um, quite excited about that. I mean, the summary suggests that regardless of nonverbal IQ, um, uh, you know, pre language clusters, you know, the the, the pre language skill of um, you know dancing and you know playing patty cake and chase and peekaboo and you know singing and that really predict uh, the rate of change over time for language. So um, uh, children's ability to, before the start of intervention to engage in these simple games and routines and other play uh, really appears to predict how much uh, language development they have over five years. So what does that really mean? You know, should we all start going and play patty cake with our kids and peekaboo with our kids right away? And, you know, if they can't, you know, is this a, you know, a huge problem? Well, yes and no. You know, yes, um, uh, you know, if they, they don't have these skills, they may make less progress over time. But no, even kids, as you saw on that scale, even if they had fewer of those skills, they were still, they weren't, it wasn't, you know, their trajectory wasn't going down. It was still going up a bit. But what I really think is important is that, um, if young children do have these skills, um, don't have these skills, how do we teach them? And I think we have to think about what these skills mean, what they represent, right? It's not just the art of playing chase. It's not just playing peekaboo. There's something inherently different than teaching a child behaviorally peekaboo, where they, you know, they know how to pull the thing off and they know how to say peekaboo, than one who's actively engaging in peekaboo with you, right? There's something in there that's a little more. And that's about turn-taking, imitation, and action words pointing and labeling. And many of the programs that we do have these as goals. These games and routines require, uh, they require imitation skills, joint attention, desire for social engagement. So, you know, the results suggest that, you know, we should, you know, think about including, you know, this in early intervention. So the punchline is that uh, the research supports the theory that language disorders are, you know, secondary to limitations in individual child factors such as social effective skills, and that language is really developed through this motivation to socially act, interact with others, and social experiences in turn motivate the acquisition of language. I think we're all looking at the child who's in front of us, right? If we come to, uh, if we come to intervention by looking at the child first and seeing their strengths and needs and developing our intervention based on the research that we know that works for this child, then I think we'll, we'll find it easier to work together. So teamwork. I mean, there is research to show that providing services for kids with special needs in general really uh, requires expertise of professionals from several disciplines, uh, uh, depending on the family. But the research indicates that um, teamwork results in more effective and efficient services than those provided individually. Uh, you know, I wanted to sort of identify who are the team members. Well, of course, the parent and, and the, the caregiver and the child themselves are part of that, a core part of the team. Um, and I think with families, it's, it's really uh, a lot of families that I've talked to in this province, uh, some families are, are you know, they're, they're great and, and they're, they advocate and they, 
they're, they're saying, you know, no, I, I want more people on my team. And when somebody tells them, no, you don't need that person, they say, I know my kid. I want that person to come in. Even if they consult, I want them to come in. I want them to be a part of this team because I know it's going to help my kid. Um, you know, and I think part of our job, too, is to help empower families to be able to have those decisions. Um, Behavior consultants, of course, in this province are a big part of the team. Speech language pathologists can be part of the team. Behavior interventionists are typically the ones that are doing most of the frontline work and I think as I talked about before it's really important that behavior interventions have the appropriate supervision within the team if that supervision comes from the BC comes from the speech path comes from whoever is the OT whoever is part of these professionals uh, really part of their job really needs to remember that they need to ensure that this person is doing you know the right thing on a day day to day basis and this person really doesn't need to have these people fighting and telling this person each a different story, right? It doesn't help, you know, the whole growth of the child. So it's really nice when people start to, you know, pick their, um, you know, different types of, uh, of expertise and bring it to the behavior interventionist who then can sort of meld those things together. There's occupational therapists, uh, physiotherapists, psychologists, um, many... Um, uh, they may not play a role on an ongoing basis, but in this province there are psychologists who are also behavior consultants on the Registry of Autism Service Providers list. A uh, physician may not play a, a, a role. They're not coming to team meetings, right? So, um, but certainly uh, it's important to keep the physician involved, you know, if there's, especially if there's any other uh, medical issues that may come up. Supported child development. And we ha then we have to remember parts of the team, too, in terms of, um, I think in, in this province, we have teams, sort of home teams, and then we have sort of the school teams, right? But the home teams and the school teams need to be one team, and we have to figure out a way to help bridge that gap a lot of the times. Some people do it really well, I, and, and I'm sorry, these are all really early intervention team members. I'm, I'm skipping the school age team members in this slide, but in the early intervention, some families are, are really good at you know, the, they're supported. Now, so does everybody know what supported child development is? So supported child, I'll just quickly go. Supported child development uh, offers services to kids, all children with special needs in this province, and if children need support in a preschool or a daycare environment and they, they need some sort of support, they, they may have support in terms of the consultant coming and working with the preschool staff and teacher to help them better support the child, or they may have support more like you see in school sometimes with an, an actual educational or, or, or supported child development assistant coming in and being an extra person within that classroom with the child. So uh, some families are, are pretty good in getting this supported child development consultant coming to the team meetings, but if they have a supported child development, um, uh, let's call them assistant or equivalent to an educational assistant, they sometimes have this person, that educational assistant, and the BI be the same person. They're able to hire that BI as well. So they get some nice consistency across those two areas where that BI can, you know, work with. And then, then what happens is you get a better connection with the SLP in the school and the preschool teachers and all that. So it can work. So the multidisciplinary team, so aligning, you know, again, so here's sort of my, you know, points on this is that, you know, do we align with a name brand? And, and a lot of times we do get this in British Columbia where people say, well, I'm an RDI, you know, therapist, or I'm a, you know, what, you know, a, 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 a low vast therapist. And I think that, um, we need to uh, move away, not necessarily from the name brand, but we need to focus on the individual strengths, but we need to focus on that and put that in here within the understanding of the science. And we do know from the science, from the stuff I showed you, that these combinational approaches as well as the behavioral-based approaches with a, with a real grounding in applied behavioral analysis with also a grounding within developmental approaches um, and combining those really can provide um, a better outcome. Uh, uh, approach to intervention, so focus on the child's individual strengths within that family unit. Um, so, and, and look at approaches to intervention. As we saw, especially, in, uh, I really liked how Dawson and Berner um, uh, sort of 
talked about the review of interventions. It's a nice way to look at it. You know, looking at the early intensive side, but also thinking, well, part of this team is we may need to add on. We need to have this treatment, but we may need to add on a six-month thing on joint attention. We may need to add on uh, some groups on social skills. We may need to, and those bring in other team members. So these are things that I think that we really need to sort of think about. We may need to add in there better uh, training for families or parent-mediated training. And we maybe also need to address, especially uh, for some kids, uh, the problem behaviors using, um, you know, uh, functional assessment of the behavior and things like that. So I think that all of these sort of interventions, if we have only are just thinking of early intensive intervention as, you know, the way we have been thinking of it all the time is early intensive intervention, you know, you're either in an EIBI program or you're in a floor time program and you're in some sort of program, whereas thinking of, of that where you have other multidisciplinary um, people coming in to add on to that, I think it will make a nice package. And all team members have something co to contribute and, and, and part of that is to empower families to um, stick up for their uh, um, their child in saying that they, they want to bring in other team members. So it's empowering families, and I think empowering families, a, a point that I did want to make is about quality versus quantity. And a lot of times, you know, there is a lot of research to suggest that um, better outcomes are associated with more hours of intervention. But it's also very clear that high quality intervention goes a long way. Like you really have to empower families to to not just think about um, hours, but also think about the quality of those inter of hours per week, and that your team, who's trained, who is going on the research evidence, can help support um, those hours being more quality, and, and that those hours. Um, you know, if, if they're providing, and I think it's, it's upon us as professionals to know that a part of our job and to be very clear with families up front that part of our job is to supervise and provide, provide guidance to those BIs on a regular basis.